It's time for Michigan's newest sports talk show, Mitt Madness. And here he goes. He's been championship. Michigan sports talk from here in Battle Creek. The latest stories, the biggest games, all across the Mitten State. That's not something to play with. Streaming live and on demand on the 95.3 WBCK app. Here are your hosts, Jacob Harrison and Dejon Hughes. All right, hello there. Good morning. Welcome in. It's Mitten Madness on 95.3 WBCK. I'm Jacob Harrison. That's Dejon Hughes. We're already off to a better start because I can say the name of the show this week. <laughs> We're going to have some fun. Uh, DJ and I are going to debate something here in just a little bit that uh, I think everybody might have a passionate opinion about. Just kind of sprung to mind the other day and wrote about it on BCK. We'll get into that soon. We're also going to touch on the WNBA because a lot of discussion is going on with that. We're going to do it without talking about Caitlin Clark for an entire segment. Uh, we'll also make our picks. We've got a little shake up there uh, as well. So a lot coming up. DJ is back from Philly, though. So how you doing, man? Dude, I'm happy to be back. It's It's been a, a interesting week this week, whether you want to talk in the sports world or just in the daily world of radio. <laughs> uh, but no, the, the trip was amazing. I got a little bit of time away. I did still work, as you guys did hear me do the pod last week. And I also did everything else th- th- that I do um, uh, for a daily, uh, as far as daily activities here. So it was just a nice little break, not in the office, working remotely and getting to enjoy some nice weather. It was like 80s all week there. So that was awesome. And and then there was tons of good lacrosse. So happy man. DJ's got like 600 hours of PTO saved up because when he goes on vacation, <laughs> he doesn't take time off. Uh, <laughs> hey, got to be smart here. You got to use it in, the, in advantageous times. Hey, yeah, for real. I mean, I, I, I don't have any myself because <laughs> of uh, how it works out. So, uh, but we'll make it work. Got the kids up here. We're going to hit the lake sometime this weekend. We're, we're having a lot of fun with that. So. Things are chugging along. Let's get into a topic that sprung up earlier in the week. Um, As I was, you know, we have to write. That's that's part of the responsibility as of radio people now. Uh, And article idea came to mind about the potential of a Super Bowl coming back to Ford Field. Now, I I have a lot of sentiment with Super Bowl 40 and you know that taking place at Ford Field I've I've found a mug of Super Bowl 40 that's in my office uh on a trip to to Gainesville Florida at an antique shop like I I love that game because it was like the first game that I sat down and watched start to finish and understood what I was seeing and I was a Steelers fan I had already uh you know gotten a Jerome Bettis jersey and all that and that was his last game at home and all those sorts of things. I love that game. And I have a deep appreciation for the Detroit lions living up here and, and a lot of family history as well with that franchise. So when I say that the super bowl is never ever coming back to Ford field, I don't say it with, with malice. I say it with, with perspective. Um, that said, it seems like there's reason to believe that that's not the case. And a lot of that can, can come to the fact that the lions have the attention of the NFL world right now. They're one of the best teams in the league. I think, I think we talked about it last week, how they're third or fourth in the odds to, to go to the super bowl. Uh, one of the top teams to potentially reach the NFC championship. Uh, no reason to believe that they're going to have a setback from the success that they enjoyed in 2023. And then the NFL draft was hosted in Detroit. And a lot of people probably thought when that was announced that that was going to be a disaster. It was nothing but a overwhelming success, not only for the NFL, but for the city as well. And it, I think it kind of showed the rest of the world that Detroit, well, yes, it's still got a long way to go. It's a city on, on the come up and it's making its improvements. Um, that said, I don't think all that translates into a Super Bowl ever coming back to Detroit ever again. But DJ, I'm going to give you the floor to give your arguments because uh, I've, I've already got mine. I want to hear yours. Uh, the only things that have me thinking there is a chance it comes back is the NFL has already said they will not be playing the Super Bowl in stadiums that have open don't like open fields 
Ford Field is far from open. Let me tell you, the thing is closed, more than closed. It, <laughs> it is an enclosed dome-like structure. So that is checkbox number one. Um, I think number two is your team has to be solid slash you have to have like a legitimate fan presence there. Because what I think happens is that they want some general fans at the game. Like you understand you're going to get travelers that are, you know, for their team and want to see their team in the Super Bowl. You're going to have people who have moved and, and live in that area that you're having the Super Bowl that support one of the two teams. But you still want people who are just football fans to buy a ticket at the Super Bowl because it's in their stadium or it's in their city. It's close. And I think you have that here. When you look at Ohio, when you look at Illinois, when you look at Minnesota, um, maybe even Wisconsin and Michigan, that's four or five states right there. And even Indiana, if you want to throw them in there, that have a chance of buying tickets. And there is a large football presence in all of those states minus maybe Indiana. The football presence isn't as high. So you're looking at a large group of people who could just choose to buy a ticket to go and experience the event. You saw a lot of that with the NFL draft this summer, which I think helps their case. If the draft didn't go well, we're probably not having this conversation at all because I think the NFL looks and goes, hey, we tried to do something here in Detroit to see what their fanship and what things are like, and they didn't show out. But the city was on fire for the entire weekend of the NFL draft. I think that helps a ton. And the bigger thing is it's an enclosed space. So why not? I think they have a better, like when you look in this area, they have a far better chance than Chicago at the moment. And they, they Green Bay is never going to host one. I'll tell you that much. It's open and it's cold as ever up there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you look at how they like to do things, they have a chance. I'm not saying it's for sure going to happen, but I'm not closing the door on it either off the simple fact that they have an enclosed space and there are tons of just natural football fans up here that warrant the experience coming here and they would give the NFL the profits and such that they're looking for. So you're right about the dome aspect when it comes to Northern stadiums. I'm not even sold on the fact that they'll come back to MetLife Stadium. Uh, there was a bad Super Bowl to begin with, but it was also just incredibly cold. Uh, a lot of the stadiums that are announced are brand new domes. They're not old domes. Um, and it, it may be a bit of a shock of reality, but Ford Field, along with NRG Stadium, which most recently hosted Super Bowl 51, um, those are the oldest dome stadiums in the NFL. They were both built in 2002, so they're both over 20 years old. And again, we're, we're almost at the 20-year anniversary of Super Bowl 40. Uh, NRG Stadium had the longest wait between Super Bowls that we've ever seen, and that was 13 years. They're not getting another Super Bowl at NRG Stadium. Like the, the last time that it was there, it was heavily scrutinized that it was at that awful stadium. Because that stadium doesn't, it's not as good as Ford Field. It's one of the worst stadiums in the NFL, bar none. It's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good field. It's not a good stadium. It's not a good venue. Um, the next three Super Bowls have already been announced. Caesar Superdome, which is technically the oldest dome <laughs> in the NFL. However, the renovations that make it even playable because they had to comp practically rebuild the stadium after Katrina, that all happened in 2005. It's practically a brand new stadium with all the modern amenities. Plus, it has Bourbon Street. <laughs> uh, new Orleans is always going to be, it, it's the most common destination for the Super Bowl uh, outside of Miami. Then Levi Stadium is after that. That's not a dome stadium, but it's in sunny California. SoFi is the year after that. SoFi is an incredible stadium. After that, you're looking at Nashville's new stadium, which will be a dome. Nashville is one of the, the fastest growing cities in the country. Uh, a great party scene as well, similar to New Orleans uh, uh, Bourbon Street. Nashville's Broadway Street is, is also a fun treat for tourists and people that live in the area. Then you've got Chicago's new stadium, which will be a dome. Uh, and will be a fantastic looking venue for a Super Bowl. That's that's putting us near a 30 year gap when you account for the fact 
that U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis is going to get another one relatively soon. Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta is going to get another one relatively soon. And Allegiant Stadium will get another one relatively soon. That's eight of the next uh, you know, nine or ten Super Bowls that are going to happen. And then you're looking at Detroit being nearly 30 years old before or, or the stadium, Ford Field, being nearly 30 years old before it gets another opportunity. The average stadium age of a NFL stadium is less than 20 years old. And you've got to think about the really old stadiums that are skewing that number like Ford or excuse me, not Ford uh, Soldier Field, Arrowhead Stadium and, and those types of places that are never going to get torn down. Uh, but, you know, Chicago obviously is already about to, to venture out somewhere new. Um, all of that kind of leads me to believe there's just no space for Ford Field to ever host it again. And by the time we get to 2037, when the lease is up, I'm not so sure. I'm not saying that they need to rebuild to get it back. But by then, I think Detroit's going to be in such a great spot, especially if the Lions are succeeding and, uh, you know, the, the city continues to improve at the pace that it is. They'll be in a great position in 13 years, which is mind boggling, to host another Super Bowl. I'm not saying I'll never come back to Detroit. I'm just saying it's never going to be at Ford Field because by then the stadium is going to be too old. It's just going to be too old and the renovations won't be there. They're not going to make the state of the art renovations. It's not going to be appealing to whatever eight, 12 K televisions are playing. You know, by the time we get to that stage, it just doesn't sound like it's in the cards to me. All right, we're going to move on. We'll debate something new on the other side, though. DJ and I agree uh, a lot more on that one. Uh, That's next here on Mitten Madness 95.3. Madness, 95.3 WBCK. I, I think I jinxed myself in the beginning. I feel like I'm struggling with the name of the show again. I don't know what has happened. Um, I, I, I can't explain it. Jacob Harrison and Deshaun Hughes here to talk Michigan sports and more. Uh, we're getting into the heat of the offseason. So. Uh, that said, a lot of talk right now around the WNBA. For better or worse, no matter what side of the Caitlin Clark thing you're on, uh, and for whatever your reasons may be with that, uh, the WNBA is getting some hype and it's well deserved. Um, some of it, you know, might be from a negative life, but hey, uh, a lot of famous people have said bad press is still press. <laughs> it's attention, and that's what the WNBA needed. They're they're making they're making more money than they've ever made. I'm sure. Um, some of those may be for watching Caitlin Clark lose, but you take what you can get. That said, uh, Detroit's missing out on that. Michigan itself is missing out on women's basketball. Uh, I don't think, and I don't mean to speak, you know, out out of pocket or out of turn. I don't think any of the college programs in the state are particularly, you know, contending. And there's no Detroit shock. So there's no opportunity there to get back and, and take advantage of what the WNBA is enjoying right now, which is publicity and success. Uh, so, DJ, you and I both both agree it, it's time to bring them back. Yeah, I mean, you look more. I think you got to pay attention to how Detroit was during the years of ninety eight to two thousand and eight. It was a bustling city. There were tons of things to do. People wanted to be in the city of Detroit. The Lions were having good years here and there. The Tigers won a world series in that time span and were great on a consistent basis. The Detroit uh, Red Wings were right in the middle of their, um, what do you call it? Uh, Right in the middle of their 25 year playoff streak where they were winning and they had won a a Stanley cup or two within that time span as well. So the city was at an all time high where high school sports were constantly winning championships. University of Michigan was doing well. Michigan state was doing well. And now you have all of these sports teams doing well you slide in the the detroit shock and they win three cha- three wnba championships in what's that 10 years and then they go out and they also win four conference championships in that time span as well it was an instant success you had a guy like bill lambeer decide to be the coach at one point like the historical marker pieces of that team or those teams, but also how they fit into the grit and grind of the city of Detroit 
and how just bustling the city was. Downtown was vibrant. There were tons of things to do. There were always concerts. And then you could just choose which sporting event you wanted to go to, or you could take a small drive down to the Palace in Auburn Hills to watch the Pistons or the Shock, and everybody there was delivering awesome memories for teams. This was still around the time where the Pistons were kind of building their dynasty that went to multiple championships as well. And there's there's actually reason to believe that this might happen. It's not just pure speculation. Uh, you might have seen it on Sports, Sports Illustrated uh, about a week ago where the Detroit Pistons are actually in talks with the WNBA to bring the shock back. Uh, Kevin Grigg, the Pistons chief communication officer said, uh, quote, the Detroit shock enjoyed success of won championships during their run in the two thousands. Uh, they won three championships in six years, by the way. And we celebrated the anniversary of their 2003 championship at a Pistons game last season. While nothing is imminent, the prospects of bringing a WNBA team back to Detroit is intriguing. And we have interest. Should they open another round of expansion? We will continue to engage in a conversation with the WNBA going forward. That, of course, alluding to the fact that uh, two new teams will be added to the WNBA within the next two seasons. The Golden State Valkyries, which is a killer team name, by the way. Oh, (laughs) they'll be joining the the WNBA in 2025. A Toronto team, which hasn't had a team name announced just yet, uh, will be coming in 2026. However, the WNBA commissioner, uh, Kathy Engelbert, relayed the league's plans to increase to 16 teams by 2028. They listed a handful of potential expansion cities, including Philadelphia, Portland, and Denver. All of that information just uh, to CYA is coming from Sports Illustrated. Um, that said, I, while Philly and Denver are understandable, and I get it, Portland does have trailblazers. They've, they've got their own thing. If you're going to get up to 16 teams, Detroit's got to be one of them, man. It, it's it's uh, there, There's a culture aspect to it, but there's also the historical aspect of the fact that the Shock have won championships. This is a team that if you're going to expand the WNBA, and they're in a perfect position to do so, because regardless how you feel about Kayla Clark, she ain't going anywhere. And she's putting eyes on the other superstars in that league, which is the whole benefit of, of her, whether she's good or not, she's showing off the other talent because people are paying attention. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if she's the savior of the, of the league or if she's the greatest to ever do it. She's showing off the talent that is already present as well. So, all of that talent's not going anywhere anytime soon. Some of it should be in Detroit. <laughs> there should be an opportunity for people who love basketball to see basketball whenever they want and to have the opportunity, if the Pistons are bad, to see the Shock if they're good. And if the Shock are bad, then to see the Pistons if they're good. And if they both suck, to just go support their local teams if they're both great to enjoy that. And uh, it, it's time. It's it's absolutely time. I was unaware of the fact that they had won. I knew that they had won a championship uh, once I had learned that they existed. I did not know that in six years. That's insane. This should be a legacy team. It shouldn't have gone anywhere to begin with. But if you're going to expand, I understand you've already got Golden State and Toronto lined up. Billy is totally understandable. Denver with the success of the Nuggets, I get it. Detroit's got to be one of the teams. So a couple things. Firstly, I do think it matters with the whole Caitlin thing about – her being the savior of the league, it, it just follows a complex that many people don't agree with. And I think that's where a lot of the issues are coming up is, hey, you can say Caitlin's good and you can say you want to watch her, but don't say she's saving our league. Don't put her up as this moniker when there have been people before her, there are people now and there are people after her who are better than her, who you should be putting on that pedestal. I think that is where the real problem in all of that comes. Nobody like... I won't say nobody dislikes her, but nobody just like simply hates on Caitlyn just because she's Caitlyn. There's this other factor of, hey, she's good, but she's overshadowing X, Y, Z a million times of these players here who should be getting that spotlight as well. You don't see this happen in the NBA because everybody who's at that stature gets enough spotlight. They may not be getting the same spotlight, but they get enough and I, that's where the real frustration and the players, these are players who are coming out and saying this like, hey, you're watching me too, but the media doesn't want to talk about that. Yeah. And, and that's where that frustration comes in. As far as now the shock being back, it may be a little bit difficult because technically they're still in the league. They were rebranded to the Tulsa Shock and then the Tulsa Shock were rebranded to the Dallas Wings. So there's some things that would have to go on there, but I'm sure they could work it out. But that may be a bump 
in the road and why it may take a little bit of time for the Detroit Shock to return. Mm-hmm. And if they do return, they may not even be the Detroit Shock. That's what they I was about to say. They may just go to a totally different team moniker and name to avoid all of that that is there as well. And then Philly may be down the road a little bit. We don't know when we're going to get Philly um, as far as that because you have to have somebody buy into the team in terms of money-wise. But then also the scheduling there in Wells Fargo is insane. You have the Flyers who own I was going to say because the hockey and, and basketball then, share it. Well, you have the 76ers. Yeah. But then also the Philadelphia Wings, the indoor lacrosse team plays there. And the Villanova men's basketball team plays games there Ooh, boy. from time to time. That would be tough. So there's four or five, six teams already in there on top of concerts and everything else you have yeah. coming through. That's a very popular arena. For them. So they would either have to find another arena to play in in the area, or they would have to get in with all of that and have a crazy schedule. So there may be a pump on, on Philadelphia, but... Yeah, well, the, the, that would be several years away anyway. I think the Shock's bigger problem here is what's going to happen with branding and how they decide to go from there. That is the one, like, roadblock from Detroit having a women's NBA team again. Yeah, I think... At the very least, if you don't get the shock, which would be disappointing, uh, but if you don't get the shock, you can just do what the Houston Texans did because that sounds very similar to the fact that the Houston Oilers moved to Tennessee, became the the, the Tennessee Oilers, then rebranded to the Tennessee Titans, and they still own all of the Houston stuff. The Texans can't wear Houston Oilers throwbacks because they're not the Houston Oilers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are situations... Uh, I can't speak to a lot of, you know, because I know there's a ton of relocations in the NBA, uh, but there's also the situation where the Cleveland Browns moved to the to Baltimore, became the Baltimore Ravens overnight, but the current Cleveland Browns still hold their franchise's history. Uh, I think you kind of just have to release yeah. the name rights and everything is the new. It just depends. So, like, at that time, <laughs> I think the Ravens had to, like, release the rights and everything to the Browns so that the Browns could have it. Well, they and they then, just became a new franchise altogether. Yeah. There's a reason Cleveland Browns fans hated Art Modell <laughs> so badly till that man's passing. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, it was it was very very ugly. But yeah, they won 2003, 2006, and 2008. Yeah, WNBA championships. They also won the 2007 Eastern Conference Finals, losing to the uh, the Mercury in a seven game series for the championship that year. Um, so they they went to three straight championships from 2006 to 2008 and won two of those three. And then they won the first one they went to in 2003, which they were one of the first expansion teams in the WNBA. And they were the first expansion team to win a championship, which was in 2003. So I'm trying to see if the, the, so I'm not seeing anything. And, and this is a very quick Google search where I'm trying to see if they just claim them. Uh, I'm not seeing that the Dallas wings claim the shock championships. I don't think they claim it, but like, so if you don't claim it, then you're saying it's, that's not ours. They are, they do claim it at least okay. on the, on the Wikipedia page. Right, that's that's where I saw a lot of yeah, stuff on it. The Wikipedia, Wikipedia page at least says that they claim those championships okay. and conference cha- titles. So that would create a problem. So either way, uh, the Detroit shock, or the Detroit women's basketball team, if you need to name it such. We've seen that be perfectly fine in the past. <laughs> do what you got to do. Bring to a hockey club. <laughs> right. Bring it back. Bring it back. We want to see it. Uh, people want to go out to those games. Uh, it's, it's not just me and DJ. We promise. We want to see the WNBA back in Detroit. That's going to do it for uh, that topic. We are going to uh, touch on the Tigers and a few other things here on the other side. Here on Mitten Madness, 95.3 W. Detroit sports fans, Wolverines, and Spartans alike. This is your sports show, Mitten Madness, with Jacob Harrison and Dejon Hughes on 95.3 WBCK. Back here on Mitten Madness, 95.3 WBCK. I'm Jacob Harrison. That's Dejan Hughes. Uh, we've had some fun debating and talking about a few things that are a little bit uh, outside of what's actually going on. That's because it's just not a whole lot going on. Uh, but we are going to talk about some uh, updates with the Detroit Tigers as well as the Detroit Pistons here. Uh, let's get started with the Pistons because I think that'll be the, the quicker topic when you make sure it gets in. Uh, the Detroit Pistons have fired. Uh, this happened about a week ago, so we're just reacting to it. 
it. <laughs> Just to give us a break. Uh, Troy Weaver is out as general manager of the Detroit Pistons. Um, and ne- neither DJ nor I uh, are, are particularly crazy about this because uh, you fired the GM who hasn't really done much wrong in, in our eyes. That's our opinion. But but you're holding on to a coach that, that wasn't putting his players in a great position to succeed. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Break it down, DJ. <laughs> this, this is dumb. We've talked about it all season long and how this team is actually constructed very well. You have a young core. You're trying to figure out what veterans you want to add to that group so that you can win games and get into the playoffs and then find out what happened. But when you really look at how this team was, injury management did not go well. Load management did not go well. Numbers wise, we didn't necessarily get people the minutes I felt they should have gotten. And all of that really comes back to Monty Williams as a head coach not doing his job in terms of putting the right five on the floor, noticing trends in players, letting players figure things out. Jalen Duran didn't start the season off well, shooting or playing defense. We call those slumps. And as long as I've been involved in basketball and sports, your best players get to work their slumps out on the court, yeah. on the field. You don't mm-hmm. put them out on the bench and try and make them work it out in practice. Because as much as you try and simulate, you can't create game like reps in practice. You can get as close as you want to, but it's simply just a different feeling when you're going 100% against a team in a different color jersey. And the Pistons needed and still need a coach that is going to be able to look out and say, okay, I have this five on the floor right now, but these two guys aren't really mixing in with this group. So maybe I should pull this guy and this guy switch these guys around. And now I have two groups of five that are very solid. Or you got a group of a group of five out there. One guy is getting a little tired, not able to play as good a defense. Okay, let's throw the six man in. He's going to play good defense, grab some rebounds, and we can continue to hit things on the offensive end. He's not making any of those adjustments. He's not calling timeouts at the right time. He's not even yelling at referees when they make a wrong call. You have three jobs as a coach. Call a timeout, put the right five on the floor, and yell at referees, and somehow you're not doing any three of them, and you still get to keep your job where you're paying millions? But the guy who finally decides to learn how to draft the Detroit Pistons has to get kicked out of here. And it's not like he's even getting the good draft picks he should be getting. He's getting the fifth pick every year, and he still has a great roster in front of you. What are we doing? So it's not the first front office shakeup of the offseason. Obviously, if you follow the Pistons closely, you know they hired uh, Trahan Langdon from the New Orleans Pelicans as the new uh, president of basketball operations. A lot of changes there in the front office. Uh, I, I love this little, you know, this was 15 days ago <laughs> Woj broke this and he was like Langdon can have the opportunity to sit down with uh, Troy Weaver and Monty Williams discuss how they can work together uh, apparently if you know they had that opportunity it didn't last very long DJ real quick make it make sense to somebody like me I know the the basketball calendar moves a lot faster than most sports but firing your GM 20 days before the the draft that 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 seems very questionable questionable to me. Now they they could already have a GM in place, an idea of who they're going to hire, and announce that in the next four or five days. Whatever. Still, that's a quick turnaround. I know we kind of have an idea of what they're going to do at five. Uh, top of the draft seems pretty well laid out at this point. We're still three weeks away, but make that make sense. It, it, it's pretty much along the lines you just said. Like if it's if you're going to do it, you want to do it before the draft. You want this guy to be able to get a look at because I, I would assume they have someone lined up pretty quickly. I I don't think you fire before the draft if you aren't hiring quickly after. So you want a guy to be able to get a look at his roster, maybe watch some film up on the guys or, or get you know a look at them in an in a OTA or something like that and then make his decisions draft-wise. You don't want him to come in after the draft and have to deal with a team that he didn't put together. Oftentimes that runs into some issues with um, not only salary cap but just guys getting moved around that maybe shouldn't be – um, because he's just looking at a team that he's not familiar with. So there's that point. And then things pick up quickly. Um, and what you don't want to do is is fire your GM now and then look up in two, three months when you're starting camp and don't have a GM. That is an issue. And the thing is, you can fire now and just consult your coach. Which that, that sounds very which, dangerous. Which, first off, I'm not a fan <laughs> of. But realistically, you can just consult your coach and say, hey, you know, who do you think in this draft fits well with our, yeah. our scheme and all these things and then hire a GM later. It's not something that you like need for the draft. That's so assume, backwards to my brain though. Th- yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. we hear about it all the time in the NFL where, Oh, it's not that regime's quarterback or whatever. Like it was with Justin Fields. It's like, well, <laughs> if you got coaches just making decisions and now a GM is hired, it, it sounds backwards. All right, let's get to uh, the Tigers. The Tigers are uh solid. 500. They are sitting at 31 and 31, uh, fourth in the AL Central. Things are are kind of just 
evening out. It, it's kind of what we talked about early on in the season. Bats are a little quiet right now. Uh, they did put up uh, against Boston uh, in game four of that series, which they split with the Red Sox. They also won the series against Texas Rangers, which was... I, I think that that really just came down to the fact that uh, Scoop Hall and, and Flaherty played in those first two games because it was a 2-1 victory, 3-1 victory, and then they lost 9-1 after that. So now they've got the uh, Milwaukee Brewers this weekend in a home series, and then they'll start next week against the Washington Capitals. Also at home, obviously, Scoop Hall will take the final game of the Milwaukee series, while Flaherty will have that first game against the Capitals. I'm, I'm saying Capitals. It's Nationals. I don't know why I was doing that. Beautiful. Beautiful job. Yeah, thanks. At least I caught it. (laughs) At least I realized it. Uh, The Washington Nationals, I promise I knew that was a baseball team. Uh, (laughs) That's embarrassing. Nonetheless, Flaherty will play the first game against the Washington Nationals on Tuesday. So these are two interesting uh, series coming up for the Tigers, though I think that Milwaukee one sounds a little difficult. But nonetheless, just kind of more of the same as we're settling in and we we start to figure out exactly what the Tigers need once we get closer to, you know, the all-star break trade deadline those sorts of things right DJ yeah I mean I think the Milwaukee series will be fun um you know we have Olsen Mize and Scoob on the on the mound so those are three guys I actually trust throw some strikes and and it'll be interesting to see what the field can do because uh, the Brewers have some bats up um, their pitching isn't as great um but they're still pretty good so uh this should be a solid series I think the Washington series is one we should win and possibly sweep and then the Houston series will be interesting considering that Mize, Scoob and Flaherty would be on the on the mound for those three games uh and it is on the road. Houston's good, um, but they haven't started off as well as some people thought that they would. So there's a chance for the the Tigers to steal another series there against some good competition. I just like the sandwich here with the Washington series, having two tough series on the outside, that Washington series in the middle, which should be kind of decent or at least a win, is something kind of just give a little cushion to the Tigers to at least feel good about if they were to lose two series on the bookends here. Yeah, the Astros are generally a good team when they're at home. Uh, they are they're well below 500 right now. They're 28 and 35, uh, which which puts them at number 17 on the ESPN Power Rankings right now. And Detroit is at number 14. Uh, to kind of put everything into perspective, there the the Brewers are at number six, while the uh, Washington Nationals are uh, down at 24. So uh, and and really the Nationals are only one game worse than than the Astros at the moment. But like I said, Astros tend to play pretty well at home. So that'll be an interesting road trip for the Tigers. Nonetheless, I think, uh, you, you know, you continue to look at the Tigers and just kind of hoping that that things come together, especially when it comes to uh, the the appearances at the bat, or excuse me, in the batter's box. Uh, Spencer Torkelson, you know, first overall pick back in 2020, still kind of the guy that you're leaning on right there. Uh, young player, obviously, but good opportunity to kind of showcase the the young talent not not get too crazy with uh you know trying to to make something happen forcing something once the trade deadline does come closer and you've got an opportunity to to improve but nonetheless it does feel like that's that's definitely the the area still feel confident about the pitching so overall things kind of kind of positive do want to see them uh get continue to to close that gap at least with uh minnesota and kansas city cleveland clearly one of the best teams in the mlb but uh good opportunity to 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 gain some ground there against those other squads in the division. All right, we'll head to break. And when we come back, it's time for our picks. We'll update the past two weeks since DJ forgot the the the, the picks from the week prior. And I uh, think you'll be a little surprised with how things look at the moment. That's next here on Mitten Madness, 95.3 W. 95.3 WBCK. We're back here on Mitten Madness 95.3 WBCK. Jake Harrison and Dejon Hughes. Can't waste any time here. We got to be quick. So, DJ, update us on the standings from the past two weeks. Uh, the last two weeks were interesting for you uh, and pretty solid for me. I went four and two in back to back weeks, eight and four overall, which jumps me up 51 and 33 to 59 and 37. And you, um, Went a whopping 10 and 2 over the last two weeks, which gets you up from 47 and 37, 57 and 39. Two games back. Don't call it a comeback. I will I will hold on to my lead as long as possible. Yeah. Uh, really, don't call it a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, let's get into it. Uh, we've got some fun ones of uh, championships, uh, playoffs. We've also got some WNBA in there, which is always fun. I have got uh, started in the UFL with the XFL championship for the right to go to the USFL championship. We got a rematch in both games. Uh, obviously, I'm going to tell you about the St. Louis Battlehawks hosting the San Antonio Brahmas. Battlehawks winning home field advantage for this game by beating the Brahmas 13 to 12 last week after AJ McCarron returns to the field. Big importance of this game. The Battlehawks have by far the most attendance. So 34 and a half thousand fans per contest for the St. Louis team. Uh, McCarron has 1,500 yards, 15 touchdowns, and just four picks all season with one of the best offenses in the league. Whereas the Brahmas, they've cut it close. They've been one of those teams that fights and and scratches the claws for every win that they've had. Certainly not one of the worst teams. One of the teams that, that kind of, they had to work for what they got. They, they didn't have the namesake like the Battlehawks and the Stallions do. The Battlehawks are a three-point favorite in the Dome at America Center in St. Louis, 7 p.m. Sunday night. DJ, who you got? This one's tough for me because, you know, we just picked this last week. Things didn't go the way I wanted them to. Uh, but I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, maybe some resting going on between teams and getting ready for the playoffs and knowing they already had a spot. Possibly wanting that home field advantage, but maybe not feeling like it's that big of a deal. I'm going to go with my gut, and my gut tells me Battle Hawks. Um, I went with Brahma's last time, and and for whatever reason, the Battle Hawks are the ones who are who are really shouting at. Me. Yeah, I haven't went against the Battle Hawks at all this season. I'm not about to do it now. There's uh, one circumstance in which I will. We'll get to that <laughs> potentially if the Battle Hawks move on. <laughs> so, uh, as as per usual, kaka. <laughs> well, I will go ahead and head on over to the other um, UFL game that's going to be going on this weekend. This is the USFL Conference Championship game with a right to play in the UFL Championship game against the winner of the XFL Conference. The Panthers from good old Michigan. Wait, what a year it has been for right? Michigan football. Let's football go. is back on the rise here in the Mitten State. They're 7-3, and three, taking on the best team in the UFL at the moment, the Birmingham Stallions, who are 9-1. and one. Their one loss is, in fact, to the Brahmas, so that's something to keep an eye on for uh, um, if they end up playing again this year. Birmingham coming in as a five-point favorite, over underline sitting at 43. Panthers only three losses this year. One of them in conference play to, or sorry, two of them in conference play to the Stallions and one uh, to the Brahmas later on in the season. Do you think the Panthers have a chance here or uh, will the Stallions continue to roll? I have Panthers, Panthers just like the Brahmas, man. They lost by one point. That said, they really needed home field advantage. It is is not the 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 stallions are built like the battle hawks that is the only professional football those cities will ever get ever again so they're incredibly passionate about it and stallions have a great fan base just like the battle hawks do you didn't want to have to go back down to protective stadium to play the stallions and that's what they got to do so i i hate to say it but i i gotta stick with the alabama guys here and go with birmingham uh, i agree 100 percent. i'm gonna also be uh going with the stallions here i think they've just been too good all year and their one loss was to uh a team that also beat the Panthers this year. Um, so a team that I believe to be better. Um, and I think the Stallions may be going for what is technically a repeat considering they were champions last year. Three peat. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, they won two years in a row. So this would be a third championship for them uh, in a row. And they'll at least have a chance to compete for it, in my opinion, in, in the UFL championship game. Who'd have thunk Adrian Martinez would be having <laughs> professional football success. Let's head on over to the WNBA. I've got us with a Sunday night matchup between the Seattle Storm and and the Minnesota Lynx, two incredible team names with incredible teams. The Lynx are seven and two, four and one at home. The Storm are six and three, three and two on the road. And the Lynx have a 62% chance of walking away with a victory, though they will be playing this game without Diamond Miller. Uh, should be a fun game for the Lynx, who are on a three game winning streak, while the Storm are on a five game winning streak. DJ, who you got? Oh, man, this one is going to be so much fun. Uh, the bigger thing about this game is to know that the Storm and the Aces play Friday night in what will be a blockbuster game between them. Some two of the top teams in the league, they will be going hard. Um, so that may have a little bit of effect on this game as Storm will be traveling. And the same factor, the Lynx play Friday night against the Mercury, which I think that's a little bit easier of, of a game for them and they should be able to win. But that means they're also traveling this weekend. They play that game against, against the Mercury on the road in Phoenix and then have to travel back home to take on the Lynx on Sunday. 
Sunday or the storm on Sunday. This is this is a tough one, man. Right? <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna go with the Lynx. I've always kind of been a Lynx fan for the most part of my life, so I, I think I'm gonna stay with the Lynx here. Yeah, these are two pretty evenly matched teams uh, across the board. If you go through the the stats, uh, fraction of a uh, difference between steals, blocks, defensive points uh, is just a, a a handful of points. Field goal percentage, three point difference in favor of Minnesota. Rebound difference, three rebound difference in favor of Seattle. Handful more assists for the Lynx. The last time they played was on May 17th. It went into double overtime and the Lynx won 102 to 93. The Lynx have won both regular season games in this series, which kind of lends me to believe that the Storm are going to be looking for one here, but I am going to stick with the Lynx as well. It just makes more sense. Well, I'll take us over to the other game that's going to be going on in the WNBA for our picks. There's tons of games going on over the weekend. This one on Saturday, it is a blockbuster game. Is the New York Liberty, one of the top teams in the league, coming in 9-2, and 4-1 and one on the road, will be visiting the Connecticut Sun at Mohegan Sun Arena. The Sun are 9-0, and 6-0 and at home. They got Dewana Bonner set to play. Mariah Jefferson is a game-time decision, so she may suit up or not. Uh, and they still have Thomas, who's an absolute beast down low with Bonner as well. New York is averaging 85.5 points per game compared to Connecticut's 80, but Connecticut Connecticut has only given up 69.3 points a game. Will the Sun stay undefeated or will the Liberty shock them? Yeah, um, God, this one's tough because Brianna Stewart and the Liberty put up a lot of points too. 85 and a half points per game. Uh, it's I'll say this. Uh, the Sun, their most recent wins are over Washington, Dallas, Phoenix, and Chicago, as well as Atlanta mixed in there. Atlanta's four and four. Atlanta's the best team they beat in the past five games. Whereas the Liberty have had to take on Phoenix, Washington, Indiana, and Chicago. So both these teams are good, but the teams they're beating are less than stellar. And the Liberty lost big time to Minnesota on the road. And that is really what just kind of talked me into this. The Sun, they're perfect at home. The Liberty, they're perfect on the road outside of that loss to Minnesota. Minnesota is one of the best teams in the league. And they got gobsmacked, especially if Courtney Vandersloot is not on the on the court. She's game time decision. It's really tough for me to take the Liberty here. Here, though that's where my mind was thinking at first for the upset i'm gonna go with the sun that gives me a chance to stay on the hardwood with the or sorry no this is your turn yeah it's my turn i, I am <laughs> also taking the sun i my bad it's I, we're still on the hardwood but yeah i'm taking the sun as well i think um they've just been too good so far this year and i'm one of those team one of those persons when it comes to picking you are on my don't pick against you until you give me a reason to list when you're undefeated and that's where the Sun are right now. Yeah. Uh, I've got the Stanley Cup final game one, right? Let's get into that. The Edmonton Oilers will be on the road against the Florida Panthers in the first game of the 2024 Stanley Cup finals. Uh, the Oilers might need some of that uh, sideline assistance that they got there in the conference finals to reach this point. But nonetheless, pretty evenly matched teams here. The Where am I looking? The Florida Panthers are the favorites in this early game that'll take place tonight. A lot of, lot of day-to-day guys, evenly matched up teams. Hard to get into it right here. Uh, DJ, who you got? Florida. Uh, I wouldn't be too worried about a lot of those day-to-day guys because this is the Stanley Cup Finals we're talking about. They're going to yeah. be playing hockey for the next couple weeks, and then they're going to get a nice break, so I would expect a lot of those guys to suit up and play, regardless of what you see out there. I think this one's plain and simple. A Florida team has been in the Stanley Cup Final now for like four or five years in a row, dating back to when uh, Tampa Bay took their couple years in a row. Um, so they're comfortable here, and it's a home game for them. They don't have to do the traveling first, which it's some like three, it's some like five thousand miles between these teams each time they have to travel. Yeah, so that's a big deal, and I think that plays dividends for them to have home or home ice advantage to start things. I got the Panthers winning game one. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, Connor McDavid is winning the Stanley Cup. Uh, the Oilers will win the whole thing. I, I, I really don't have any reservations about that. I think they're hotter right now than Florida is. Florida's been the best team in the NHL all season long, but the Oilers, I think that they've just hit that stride, right, at just the right time, and I think that's what's going to propel them. However, I do think they'll lose this game one. It's the only time uh, I think that they'll lose on the road, though, because I think the Oilers are going to uh, take this one and, or, or lose this one and then take this one in six. So give me the Panthers in game one. Time for the final game of the week. The Mavericks and the Celtics. Mavericks will be in Boston again at the TD Garden. Celtics at home. 37-4 and four at home during the regular season for them. They absolutely took care of business um, a couple days ago, as you're listening to this, on Thursday night where they just 
pretty much washed their hands with the Mavericks. It's giving them a 6.4% chance to go up 2-0. Do you think that's the case, or do the Mavs strike back? So I wasn't surprised that the Mavs got destroyed <laughs> in Game 1. Okay, we, we both talked last week about how confident we were the Celtics were going to win Game 1, but the Mavs would win the whole thing. And this is very much par for the course. I'm stealing this from you. Uh, the conference first round, Clippers won by 12 in Game 1. Conference semifinals, Oklahoma City Thunder won by 12 in game one. Now, they did take game one against Minnesota. Uh, They didn't lose until game four. Nonetheless, this Mavs team isn't defined by what happens in game one. It is a little difficult with three days in between coming off of that to still have to go into the TD Garden, play the Celtics again, and say, yeah, that's not going to happen again. Christoph Porzingis is healthy. (laughs) Boy, is he. Because he was pretty dominant, as were most of the Celtics. Feels like it's smarter to take the Celtics here and then wait and then see the Mavericks take off once they get to home in game three on the 12th of June. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the Celtics here and then on Mavs the rest of the way. I'm going to do something crazy and I'm going with the Mavs here. Um, One thing Luca and Kyrie don't like to do is lose. They do bounce back very well from that. Does Jalen Brown like to lose? I didn't say that either, but I'm just saying the Mavericks are the ones that are coming off a loss right now. They're good coming off of losses. Kyrie still has a little bit to prove after he left Boston and there's so much being said there. Um, So I think the Mavs strike back to make things interesting, which means for the weekend, we're similar just about both taking Suns, both taking the Lynx, both taking the Stallions, both taking the Battlehawks, and both taking the Panthers. You've got the Celtics, and I've got the Mavs. Let's start the summer off right. I think we just completely overlooked the fact that I could have named any superstar (laughs) for the Celtics, and instead of saying Jason Tatum, I said Jalen Brown. He's not a bad player, but that is hilarious that we were just going to waltz right on by that. Um, Hopefully that doesn't do do me any disservice when it comes to this game uh, so that I can continue to climb in these standings. All right, we're back on the radio at 8 p.m. tonight. If you want to listen to the replay, we've also got the entire show on demand on the 95.3 WBCK app. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week at 10 a.m. for the show. It's called Mitten Madness, and it's here on 95.3 WBCK. For Dejon Hughes, I'm Jacob Harrison. Y'all take it easy. Join Jacob Harrison and Dejon Hughes every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. for Mitten Madness on 95.3 WBCK. Miss the show or want to play it back? Stream Mitten Madness live or on demand on the 95.3 WBCK app.